half a mile from home at the farther edge of the woods where the land was highest a great pine tree stood the last of its generation whether it was left for a boundary mark or for what reason no one could say the wood choppers who had felled its mates were dead and gone long ago and a whole forest of sturdy trees pines and oaks and maples had grown again but the stately head of this old pine towered above them all and made a landmark for sea and shore miles and miles away. Sylvia knew it well. She had always believed that whoever climbed to the top of it could see the ocean, and the little girl had often laid her hand on the great rough trunk and looked up wistfully at those dark boughs that the wind always stirred, no matter how hot the air is below. Now she thought of the tree with new excitement, for why, if one climbed it at break of day, could not one see all the world, and easily discover from whence the white hair had flew, and mark the place, and find the hidden nest? What a spirit of adventure, what wild ambition, what fancied triumph and delight and glory for the later morning when she could make known the secret. It was almost too real and too great for her childish heart to bear. All night the door of the little house stood open, and the whippoorwills came and sang upon the very step. The young sportsman and his old hostess were sound asleep, but Sylvia's great design kept her broad awake and watching. She forgot to think of sleep. The short summer night seemed as long as the winter darkness, and at last, when the whippoorwills ceased and she was afraid the morning would after all come too soon. She stole out of the house and followed the pasture path through the woods, hastening toward the open ground beyond, listening with a sense of comfort and companionship to the drowsy twitter of a half-awakened bird whose perch she had jarred in passing. Alas, if the great wave of human interest which flooded for the first time this dull little life should sweep away the satisfaction of an existence. Heart to heart with nature and the dumb life of the forest. There was the huge tree asleep yet in the paling moonlight, and small and silly Sylvia began with utmost bravery to mount to the top of it, with tingling eager blood coursing the channels of her whole frame, with her bare feet and fingers that pinched like a bird's claws to the monstrous ladder reaching up, up, almost to the sky itself. First, she must mount the white oak tree that grew alongside, where she was almost lost among the dark branches and the green leaves, heavy and wet with dew. A bird fluttered off its nest, and a red squirrel ran to and fro, scolded pettishly at the harmless housebreaker. Sylvia felt her way easily. She had often climbed there, and she knew that higher still, one of the oak's upper branches chafed against the pine trunk just where its lower branches were set close together. There, when she made the dangerous pass from one tree to the other, the great enterprise would really begin. She crept along the swaying oak limb at last and took the daring step across into the old pine tree. The way was harder than she thought. She must reach far and hold fast. The sharp, dry twigs caught and held her. They scratched her like angry talons. The pitch made her thin little fingers clumsy and stiff as she went round and round the tree's great stem, higher and higher upward. The sparrows and robins in the woods below were beginning to wake and twitter to the dawn, yet it seemed much lighter there aloft that pine tree, and the child she knew she must hurry if she was to be of use. The tree seemed to lengthen itself out as she went up, and to reach farther and farther upward, it was like a great mainmast to the voyaging earth. It must truly have been amazed that morning, through all its ponderous frame, as it felt this determined spark of human spirit wending its way higher from branch to branch. Who knows how steadily the last twigs held themselves to this weak creature? 
The old pine must have loved his new dependent more than all the hawks and bats and moths and even the sweet-voiced thrushes was the brave beating heart of the solitary gray-eyed child. And the tree stood still and frowned away the winds that June morning while the dawn grew bright in the east. Sylvia's face was like a pale star if one had seen it from the ground when the last thorny bough was passed. She stood, trembling and tired, but wholly triumphant high in the treetop. Yes, there was the sea, with the dawning sun making a golden dazzle over it. And toward that glorious east flew two hawks with slow-moving pinions. How they looked in the air from that height, when one had only seen them before far up and dark against the blue sky. Their gray feathers were as soft as moths. They seemed only a little way from the tree, and Sylvia felt as if she too could go flying away among the clouds. Westward, the woodlands and farms reached miles and miles into the distance. Here and there were church steeples and white villages. Truly, it was a vast and awesome world. The birds sang louder and louder. At last, the sun came up, bewilderingly bright. Sylvia could see the white sails of ships out at sea, and the clouds that were purple and rose-colored and yellow at first began to fade away. Where was the white heron's nest in this sea of green branches, and was this wonderful sight and pageant of the world the only reward for having climbed to such a giddy height? Now look down again, Sylvia, where the green marsh is set among the shining birches and the dark hemlocks. There, where you saw the white heron once you will see him again look look a white spot of him like a single floating feather comes up from the dead hemlock and grows larger and rises and comes close at last and goes by the landmark pine with steady sweep of wing and outstretched slender neck and crested head and wait wait do not move a finger or a foot little girl do not send an arrow of light and consciousness from your too eager eyes, for the heron has perched on a pine bough, not far beyond yours, and cries back to his mate on the nest and plumes his feathers for a new day. The child gives a long sigh a minute later when a company of shouting catbirds comes almost to the tree, and vexed by their fluttering and lawlessness, the solemn heron goes away. She knows his secret now, the wild, light, slender bird that floats and wavers and goes back like an arrow presently to his home in the green world beneath. Then Sylvia, well satisfied, makes her perilous way down again, not daring to look far below the branch she stands on, ready to cry sometimes because her fingers ache and her lamed feet slip wondering over and over again what the stranger would say to her and what he would think when she told him how to find his way straight to the heron's nest. Sylvie, Sylvie, called the busy old grandmother again and again, but nobody answered and the small husk bed was empty and Sylvia had disappeared. The guest waked from a dream and remembering his day's pleasures, hurried to dress himself that it might sooner begin. He was sure, from the way the shy little girl looked once or twice yesterday, that she had at least seen the white heron, and now she must really be made to tell. Here she comes now, paler than ever, and her worn old frock is torn and tattered and smeared with pine pitch. The grandmother and the sportsman stand in the door together and question her, and the splendid moment has come to speak of the dead hemlock tree by the green marsh. But Sylvia does not speak after all, though the old grandmother fretfully rebukes her and the young man's kind, appealing eyes are looking straight in her own. He can make them rich with money. He has promised it, and they are poor now. He is so well worth making happy, and he wants to hear the story she can tell. No, oh, she must keep silent. What is it that suddenly forbids her and makes her dumb? Has she been nine years growing, and now, when the great world for the first time puts out a hand to her, must she thrust it aside for a bird's sake? 
The murmur of the pine's green branches is in her ears. She remembers how the white heron came flying through the golden air and how they watched the sea and the morning together. And Sylvia cannot speak. She cannot tell the heron's secret and give its life away. Dear Loyalty, that suffered a sharp pang as the guest went away disappointed later in the day that could have served and followed him and loved him as a dog loves. Many a night, Sylvia heard the echo of his whistle haunting the pasture path as she came home with a loitering cow. She forgot even her sorrow at the sharp report of his gun and the sight of thrushes and sparrows dropping silent to the ground. Their songs hushed and their pretty feathers stained and wet with blood. Were the birds better friends than their hunter might have been? Who can tell? Whatever treasures were lost to her, woodlands and summertime, remember. Bring your gifts and graces and tell your secrets to this lonely country child.